Hi, everybody, and welcome back. We are in Luke chapter 23, picking up in verse 26 in our Bible study today. We have got verse-by-verse notes through all of this material, and if you want a copy of those, grab them. They are in, uh, linked down in the description. I was going to try to finish off all of chapter 23 today, but man, there's just a lot of material here. So I, I've got like almost 30 pages of notes on this, since I just decided that we're going to break this down into two uh, recordings to finish off this chapter. My goal is still to be done by the end of the week this week with the whole Gospel of Luke, uh, and I think we can do that and, and stay on track, and you'll probably appreciate a shorter video rather than the hour and 15 minutes or whatever the last one was, so let's let's not do that again. Let's talk about verse 26, and let's talk about where we've been in this chapter already. So Jesus has been put on this, subjected to this phony trial, and he's been convicted, supposedly, on the on the uh, the um, trumped up charges of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, and he was then taken to Pilate, and Pilate didn't have the courage to stand up to the Jews, and he relented and he gave in to the pressure from the chief priests. And he gave them permission to crucify Jesus. So Jesus is being led out of the city to be crucified as we pick up here in verse 26. And that verse reads, And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Cyrene was a city in North Africa. And Simon was probably in Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. I've got a map there in your notes. It, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty good ways away from Jerusalem. <clears throat> Some historians suspect that the cross probably weighed somewhere around 300 pounds. And the cross beam, which many of the condemned people were made to carry, that was probably upwards of like 100 pounds. Now, that may not have been an impossible burden for Jesus on a healthy day, but remember, this is after a sleepless night. This is after a scourging, which, if you know anything about the Roman scourgings, I mean, that was not just like a little a little whipping. You know, it's not like getting a, a, a beating with a switch by your parents. I mean, that was like a, a lot of people died just from that scourging. And then there had been other abuses throughout the night. So that 100-pound crossbeam or whatever it was probably would have felt like a 1,000 pounds. And as we look back in time and in the way that we sometimes uh, – I can't think of the word that I want, but looking back at time at being the one who was told to carry Jesus' cross – that may seem like a, a like a position of honor, you know, a, a historically uh, pretty special role to play. But if we put ourselves back into the, the first century, I think being in Simon the Cyrene's position actually would have been something that he really, that was not a position of honor in any way. Being directly associated with somebody who was on their way to crucifixion wasn't the reputation that the average citizen would have wanted. Let's read verses 27 through 30. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep over me, or do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. The, cruci the crucifixion story is a story about selflessness. And this scene is no exception. Some of the women who love Jesus, they were following him on his journey outside of the city to the place where he's going to be crucified. And it says that they were mourning for him. And they were right to mourn for Jesus' suffering as because of the injustice that was being done to him and that he was having to endure. But Jesus spoke to them, not about the suffering that he was going through and how difficult it was, but he spoke to them about his concern for their well-being, which is interesting. 
Jesus wept because of the calamities that were going to come upon them and upon their children. He says there, um, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. You know, typically, childbearing and nursing was considered an honor for a woman. For a woman. But Jesus said that there was going to be a time that was coming when it wouldn't be a blessing. Well, uh, when it, it would be a blessing not to have children. In that day, the daughters of Jerusalem would desire a covering and a hiding place in the mountains. He says, then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. So there was going to be, uh, from, from the, the, the daughters of Jerusalem, a desire for a covering. And we'll talk about what exactly that was here in a second. But what was Jesus talking about just generally? There's There's some debate about this, but... I suspect that Jesus was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that he talked about at length in Luke chapter 21, that destruction uh, that was going to come in 70 AD at the hands of the Roman Empire. And we know that that was really an outpouring of wrath upon the wickedness of the Jews who rejected the Messiah. Jesus told the, quote, daughters of Jerusalem to weep as he had wept over the city of Jerusalem in Luke chapter 19. They were weeping for him, but you know, ultimately everything was going to be fine for Jesus. Uh, he was going to be resurrected to glory in, in just a couple days after his death. Instead of weeping for him, he told them that they ought to be weeping over a city that allowed the injustices that were taking place before their eyes. <clears throat> Jesus told them to weep over the godlessness of Jerusalem and the consequences that it would bring on their neighbors and their families, because unlike the happy ending that would be Jesus' story, there would not be a happy ending for these people who fell under the wrath of God. What did... So, if he is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem here, I mean, what does that have to do with bearing children or nursing children? Why why does he say here that um, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed? <clears throat> well, if you remember our discussion in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke chapter 21, you will remember that the disciples, they had a very limited window in which they could escape Jerusalem before its destruction. And they were to avoid anything that could slow them down or hinder their escape. And being pregnant or having infants usually doesn't aid in swiftness. <laughs> um, anyone who's ever had a baby or an infant would would know that. Uh, my brother has two very young kids, and uh, he, you know, it takes a long time to go anywhere just because babies are. Um, it just takes time. Jesus had said in Luke chapter 21, verse 23, Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. And so that's um, a very similar statement is made back in that discussion of, of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now what about these mountains? This Verse 30 says, Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. So, kind of two questions here. Who is the they? Who, who is going to be saying this about the mountains? And what does this, what does this, this mean? So there's two interpretations about this. Uh, two that I felt were pretty reasonable. The first one is that the they who are calling out to the mountains, uh, that, that they are the, the righteous women, the disciples of Jesus who are going to escape the city of Jerusalem. And they saw the mountains as a place of safety, a place of hiding from the wrath of God. In Luke chapter 21, Jesus told the disciples that they were supposed to flee Judea and to hide in the mountains, and that they would find safety there. Luke chapter 21, verse 21 says, Then let those who are in the 
who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. So the disciples would find safety in the mountains from the destruction in 70 AD. That's one possibility. Then another way to interpret this verse is to look at those who are calling upon the mountains to cover them as those who didn't heed Jesus' warnings, those who rejected Jesus, those who didn't believe the prophecies about the destruction of the city. These are wicked people, and they are um, calling out to the mountains to hide them in a similar way to a way that this language had been used in the Old Testament in the prophet Hosea. Let me read to you Hosea 10, verse 8. The high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. So in in Hosea's day, the sinful, rebellious Jews, uh, they were going to be punished by God, and they wanted the mountains to hide them from God's wrath so that they could escape their punishment. Basically, they were saying, cover us so that God can't see us. Fall on us so that um, so that we're protected from the outpouring of God's anger. Or, you know, some other people think that they might have been calling out to the mountains to fall on them just to, to destroy them quickly, right? To kill them quickly. Kill us so that we don't have to endure the, the suffering that's going to come because we've been rebellious against God, right? But, so, so these are wicked people who are saying this. No doubt, the wicked people who were trapped in Jerusalem when the Roman siege began, they were wishing for um, a mountain big enough to hide them or to, uh, yeah, to hide them from the wrath of God. We see a similar picture in Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6, verses 15 through 17. Then the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich, and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? It's almost the exact same picture. These evil people want something as big as a mountain, because that's what they're going to need to hide from the Lord. Okay, verse verse 31. And this is a verse that, for me, this is a tough one to get my head wrapped around. Jesus says, For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? So you've got these evil people that he just described who are going to be the recipients of God's wrath. He says, if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when the wood is dry? Matthew Henry's commentary was helpful to me when I was trying to figure this verse out. Let me just read you a quotation that I've got from him, and maybe it'll be helpful to you as well. He says, these words may be applied more particularly to the destruction of Jerusalem, which Christ, for, which Christ here foretold, and which the Jews, by putting him to death, brought upon themselves. If they, the Jews and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, do these things upon the green tree, if they do thus abuse an innocent and an excellent person for his good works, how may they expect God to deal with them for their so doing? who have made themselves a dry tree, a corrupt and wicked generation, and good for nothing. So who who or what is the green tree? Well, it seems like here Jesus is picturing himself as the green tree. A green tree is a, it's a healthy tree. A green tree is a good tree. It has the potential to bear fruit. It's productive and it's beneficial to the world. And Jesus was the same way. He preached the word of God. He kept the law. He healed the sick. He was compassionate and he was caring. A benefit to all of those who he was around. Yet, the rebellious Jews of Jerusalem, they were about to cut him down or to kill him. Even though, even in all of his goodness and his innocence, they were about to cut down a productive tree. Someone who bore good fruit. 
So if they were willing to do that, how then ought the Jews, being dry wood, expect God to deal with them? You know, they were like dead trees, dry trees. They weren't good for anything. They didn't bear fruit. They weren't productive. They weren't beneficial to the world or anyone around them. During Jesus' ministry, he made it very clear that he thought that the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders and the lawyers, that they were dry wood. They didn't bear fruit. They didn't help anyone. And the day was coming when God would burn up that dry wood in his wrath. And what wood burns better than dry wood? And so if, if they treated Jesus this way, and Jesus was the perfect God-man uh, who was kind and generous and uh, good to everyone who he ever came in contact with, then how should they expect God to treat them on the day of judgment? Because they are nothing even close to, to Jesus. And I think that's the idea behind this verse. I'd be interested if anyone else had any other uh, interpretations of this, because it's definitely one that's, it's, it was tough for me. I'm still, still not 100% sure that I have that all locked down in, in you know, an airtight uh, interpretation. But yeah, let me know. Okay, verses 32 through 33. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Luke names the place of the crucifixion of the skull. John's gospel tells us the Aramaic name for the, the place was Golgotha. And no one knows the exact location of Golgotha with 100% certainty. There is a, a commonly accepted location that's just outside the wall of Jerusalem that you can actually visit today. And part of the reason that it's... Well, one of the things that they claim gives it credibility is the actual location of Jesus' crucifixion is that there is a uh, like a skull-like face in the cliffside of this this little hill. I have a I actually have a picture of it in your notes if you want to see it. And yeah, I I guess it looks like a face. Um, <laughs> I I kind of feel like you have to look at it at the right angle and the right light. But you know, maybe I'm not exactly sure how how credible their claim of this being the exact location is. But if you're ever over in Israel, I mean, it's probably worth stopping by and checking it out. In his death, Jesus was associated with common criminals. Two thieves were hung beside him. And if you remember, Jesus had predicted this. He had predicted it by quoting a prophecy about it. And the prophecy came from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, where it said Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors in his death. He would bear the sins of many, and uh, he would be numbered with the transgressors. Uh, he, he cited that verse in Luke chapter 22, verse 37, so just in the last chapter. And then I want to conclude this discussion and this study with... Just a discussion about crucifixion. What was it? Why was it used? Why was it invented? What was its purpose? What were its forms? And then in the, the next video, as we close out chapter 23, we'll talk about some statements that Jesus made on the cross, some things that were spe specific to his, his crucifixion and, and some of the incredible supernatural things that occurred during his crucifixion, and uh, and some other things. But yeah, let's just talk about crucifixion in general here as we close out for today. Crucifixion was a form of capital punishment, and it involved tying or nailing a criminal to a wooden cross and then elevating them in the air in sight of people who passed by. And people were often crucified in very public areas or along the roadside. And this was intentional. It was meant to be a very humiliating death. And it was meant to dissuade onlookers from participating in the crimes of the accused. 
the term crucifixion could actually mean a number of things in it could refer to a number of different execution styles it could refer to being hung or nailed on a cross beam like jesus you know kind of the the traditional way that we see it depicted in art it could also refer to just being nailed to a tree like just a, a literal tree on the side of the road uh, being nailed to an upright pole with your hands tied above your head. There's a photo, well, an uh, artistic depiction of that in your notes. Uh, almost like a like a telephone pole being nailed, and then your you know your hands would be above your head. It could also refer to being impaled on a wooden stake. Seneca, the younger, he wrote, a quote. I see crosses there, not just of one kind, but made in many different ways. Some have their victims with heads down to the ground, some impale their private parts, others stretch out their arms on the gibbet. Modern depictions of crucifixion aren't, aren't always perfectly accurate in the way that they depict the details. Crucifixion victims were usually crucified naked and that's not something that we see too often in um you know christian depictions of of jesus's crucifixion or in others but uh, that was just really to compound the humiliation of the process another thing that's slightly inaccurate is that the the nails that pierced the hands of the crucified person, they were probably not in the palms of the hands, as is often pictured. The Greek word that's translated hands in John chapter 20 and verse 25, uh, referring to Jesus' crucifixion, that can actually refer to any part of the hand or the arm from the fingertips to the elbow. And it's thought that the palms of a person's hands actually couldn't support the weight of, of a body, they would, the nails would actually rip out or tear, or tear themselves out. And so most people think that it's more likely that the nails actually went through what we would consider the wrist nowadays. There's apparently like two bones there that, that could potentially be uh, the spot where, where, um, the nails went in. And I think that there's actually archaeological evidence, people that have been dug up, tombs that have been dug up, where that has been observed. The nails went through the wrists. And usually when you see a movie about cruci crucifixion or images, you'll see that both the hands and the feet are nailed before the cross is actually lifted up, in, lifted up into the air. Uh, and that may not have been the case. It was common for a victim to be nailed to the cross beam first and then for the vertical part of the beam to, well, let me rephrase that, maybe make it a little bit clearer. So it's thought that the, the, uh, the vertical part of the cross, the vertical beam, usually was uh, already in the ground even before the crucified person arrived on the scene, or the person who was to be crucified arrived on the scene. The person who was to be crucified then carried the cross beam to that vertical beam that was already in place, and while on the ground, the individual was nailed through their hands to the cross beam. And then they were hoisted with ropes up onto the vertical beam, and it, it was at that point that their feet were nailed to it. <clears throat> the um, let me read you this quotation on another thought. This is from APU.edu, the science of crucifixion. It says, quote, once the victim was secured, the guards lifted the pull, the the cross beam and placed it on the stripes already in the ground. As it is lifted, Jesus' full weight pulls down on his nailed wrists and his shoulders and, el and his elbows dislocate. In this position, Jesus' arms stretch to a minimum of six inches longer than their original length. So basically, um, 
you can imagine this. He's nailed to the crossbeam through his hands, but then he has to be lifted up onto the vertical beam and put into place before his feet are nailed. Well, he, basically the full weight of his body would be pulling down on those nails as he was being hoisted up. And uh, this, this scientist was saying that his elbows would have dislocated, maybe his shoulders would have dislocated from all the weight that was hanging on those nails. And uh, his arms would actually extend to be like six inches longer than they would have otherwise because everything was just just out of joint, which is, uh, that alone is a gruesome picture to even imagine and the pain that must have been associated with that. <clears throat> Each crucified victim was given a titulus or a titulus, I don't know how it's pronounced, which was a sign that was bearing the name of the condemned person and the committed crime. So you think about this, this again would have added to the humiliation and would have served to discourage others from participating in their crime. So, you know, their name would be up there for everybody to read. They would probably be able to identify the person's family based on their their family name and uh, then, you know, what they did to deserve this. So it's just another way of shaming people. And if you remember the story, uh, the details that we read, of Jesus' crucifixion, you'll know that he had one of these as well. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the king of the Jews. How long a person remained on the cross depended on a number of variables. It would have def depended on their, their age, their physical condition, how badly they had been flogged or if they had been flogged whether they were tied to the crossbeam or nailed. Some people were just tied. And then it also would have depended on the position of their body and whether the attending soldiers chose at any point to expedite their death, which that sometimes happened. This was done by breaking the legs of the condemned person to keep them from lifting themselves up to breathe. Because if you've ever hung maybe on, on a jungle gym or hung, you know, and had the full weight of your body on hanging from your arms, you'll know that it's kind of hard to breathe in that position when your body is, um, well, when you're hanging like that, it puts pressure on your lungs and you kind of have to lift yourself up to fill your lungs with oxygen. The same thing happened on the cross. So if they broke the person's legs, they couldn't push off of the the nail that was supporting their their ankles or their feet, and they couldn't lift themselves up to breathe. Or, you know, eventually they'd get so exhausted from doing that solely on the strength of their arms that they wouldn't be able to do it any longer and they would suffocate. Sometimes the soldiers stabbed the heart of the crucified individual with a spear to kill them more quickly. And then sometimes they would light a fire at the base of the cross and basically just let the smoke of the fire build up until the the crucified individual suffocated from all the smoke. So all of that to say that some people hung on the cross for hours, a few hours, some people hung on the cross for a few days. I think some people even, you know, for like upwards of a week. So a, a terrible way to die. From what we know about it, crucifixion was specifically designed to be horrible and humiliating and an extended kind of, um, the kind of death that would strike fear into people, fear into, you know, the Romans hope to, to obey the law and not to rebel. And of all the ways that Jesus could have died, you know, it's interesting. I don't think that we know all of the reasons. It's interesting that God chose this one, that this was the way that, that he was going to die for the sins of the world. So in the next video, we will talk about some of the, the statements of Jesus on the cross and some of the specifics that are um, 
some of the specifics about his death and, and some of his enemies who came by to mock him while he was standing on the cro- or, uh, hanging on the cross and some other details as well. So until then, I hope that uh, this video has been, has been beneficial to you, and I will talk to you, Lord willing, tomorrow.